Uh, we're going to sing a couple more songs before our speaker uh, comes up. Uh, Adam McHugh has uh, uh, done a lot of writing, and he's been on staff of the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and has written, a, 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 not currently with InterVarsity, but has been on staff with them. But he's written a fascinating book uh, that explained a lot of things for me about why I sometimes feel a little out of place in a church. And I know that many of us can feel that for varieties of reasons, but his book is uh, Introverts in the Church. And uh, it was one of those kind of books that I, I didn't, I think, whoa, someone wrote about that. Well, Adam did. It's a wonderful book. And uh, you'll have a chance, uh, after hearing him this morning, uh, to meet with Adam and others in um, Monroe uh, to carry on a, a wide-ranging conversation about the things he'll be talking about. But Adam, we, we welcome you in the name of Christ. And after we've sung a couple more songs, Adam will come on up and... Uh, Speak to us on that theme. Let's continue to worship God. Go ahead and stand. Good morning, Westmont. I'm sure that every guest speaker stands up here in chapel every week and says something like, I'm really honored to be here. But unlike all the rest of them, I really mean it. <laughs> I've been looking forward to this for quite some time, which is saying something because I don't really get all that fired up about public speaking, even though obviously I'm really good at it. <laughs> all right, so my goals this morning are pretty simple. I want to, number one, talk about some of the ideals that we hold for faithfulness, and I want to talk about some of the ideals that we have for participation in Christian community. And number two, I want to talk about how I don't live up to any of those ideals. And maybe that's okay. Let me paint a picture for you to start out of someone who might be considered the very model of faith in a lot of Christian communities. Imagine someone who is social and gregarious, someone who has an overt passion and enthusiasm, someone who shares her faith with strangers easily, someone who is expressive and enthusiastic and transparent, someone who assumes leadership responsibilities easily and quickly, someone who participates in any number of diverse activities. A person like that would be really highly praised in most communities, right? Churches would have bidding wars to get such a person in their congregation. And the reality is you would be likely describing someone who has a beautifully, uh, is a beautifully faithful person. However, you would also be describing a person who is likely very extroverted. A few years ago, I became suspicious of some of the standards that we have for the life of faith. I have a suspicion that some of the values of our broader culture have crept in to our understanding of discipleship. Very broadly speaking, we live in a culture in which uh, people who are outgoing and action-oriented and life-of-the-party sort of people who can easily turn strangers into friends and who can make small talk about anything with anyone. And further, we often seem to give leadership and authority to those people who speak up the most and the quickest, whether or not they actually have the best ideas in the room. I think we can view people who are gregarious as confident and charismatic. We can view people who speak their minds quickly and easily as decisive and intelligent. And so I think we get this message in a number of different communities that we're a part of that if we really want to excel in the world, if we really want to excel in the church world, then we need to be as extroverted as possible. We're told that extroverts are happier, they're more adventurous, they have better relationships, they get the most out of life. And if you want to be really on fire for God, that means that you need to get out there, be as active as possible, and wear your faith on your sleeve. And as a result of this bias that permeates many of our communities and families, those of us who are a little bit quieter, 
Those of us who maybe listen a little bit more than we speak, those of us who maybe observe from the fringes before we engage in the center, we can get the message that we're spiritually inadequate, that there's something wrong with us, that the life of the church is passing us by. Well, since we're discussing ideals this morning and failing to live up to them, I thought we should turn to a scripture that for a lot of people is the go-to text for what describes the ideal Christian community. If you want the perfect church, as some would say, with everything functioning as it should and everyone participating as as they ought, then you should turn to Acts chapter 2, right? We'll see. I just want to read uh, for you verses 42 through 47 out of Acts chapter 2. This will be a really familiar passage for you. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. God, would you give us ears to hear your voice? Would you give us eyes to see your glory? Would you give us minds to understand your truth and hearts to love you? Amen. Well, I'm sure you're all familiar with this story in Acts, but let me just remind us a bit about the context. So we're situated in first century Jerusalem just shortly after the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension to the Father. But he promises his followers that he's not going to leave them alone, but that the Holy Spirit will come in this fresh way as his agent. And earlier on in chapter 2 of Acts, that promise had been realized. The Spirit comes in this dizzying display of pyrotechnics and unleashes the mission of God onto the world, whether the disciples are ready for it or not. And so Peter, who is the leader of this little band of followers of probably no more than 70 at this point, has to kind of unwillingly stand up in front of this crowd gathered for the Jewish festival of Pentecost and explain what has just happened. There's been this whirlwind and all these people are speaking in foreign tongues about the work of God and I just picture everyone in Jerusalem looking around desperately for some sort of an interpretation. To his credit, Peter stands up and he proclaims the gospel that Jesus who was crucified is risen, is the anointed king over Israel and over all the world and all are called down, called to bow down before him. And all the listeners are cut to the heart as Acts tells us, and 3,000 people repent and turn to following Jesus on that very day. Big day. So that's our situation. That's our context. And our passage is this very, is the very next scene after this huge climactic moment. N.T. Wright says that this little snapshot of the church is kind of a, the summary of the church is kind of a pause in the narrative. Something huge in world history has just happened. Some climatic event has just happened. And now we get a chance to take a breath, pause, survey, and see what we have. And so what we get is this new community of Christians living life together. What you'll notice is that we don't get a new set of rules. So the Jewish festival of Pentecost was a day in which people celebrated the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. So it would have been very appropriate, even poetic, if the Spirit had come with a new form of the law, right? The Spirit could have said, all right, Jesus is risen. That's awesome. Now here are the five principles for being a Jesus community. Thou shalt do this. Thou shalt not do this. Thou shalt drink coffee on the church patio out of styrofoam cups. Thou shalt not quote C.S. Lewis in every sermon, right? (laughs) The Spirit could have done that. And frankly, there's part of us that probably wishes that he had because it would have been a lot easier. But instead, what the Spirit does is form a new community that is gathered around the risen Christ. So I'll just do a little bit with this text this morning. I just want to talk about a couple of the overarching themes of this text. The first is that of progression or movement. 
So all the verbs are in this tense that communicate ongoing action. For all of you Greek students, all the verbs are in the imperfect. So the Greek literally reads, they were devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles. Everyone was being filled with awe, and signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles, and so forth. There's this dynamic and active feel to this community. These aren't just people that have, have the same beliefs and have said all the right prayers and can quote all their favorite Bible passages and recite all of the creeds. These are people that are moving somewhere together. These are people that are devoted to a way of life. And the second larger theme is that of intimacy. So the word fellowship in verse 42, koinonia, you all know. Um, koinonia was actually most frequently used in reference to marriage in ancient Greek. That's how intimate that term is. It means common life, life lived together. There is this sense of participation, of mutual sharing of their lives. This community is worshiping together, they're praying together, they're eating together, they're rejoicing together, they're engaged in missions together, they're sharing their possessions with one another. So in the first century, we get this picture of when you become a believer, when you become a follower of Jesus, it means you become a member of a community. So something like baptism, for example, was not only viewed as a, a symbolic act of, of cleansing from the stain of your sins, but it was an initiation rite into a new family. And these first Christians, even after their numbers swelled by 3,000, lived as though they were one single family. So that's the story of this ancient community. We have this picture of intimacy, of common life, of a growing community with new members constantly being brought into the fold. And some would say this is the ideal church to be imitated across all times and cultures. And so I guess the question is, is this something that you find appealing? Is this a community that you want? Well, there's a big part of me that doesn't find this picture of community appealing at all. There's a big part of me that wants to run away from this as fast and as far as I can. And I'm guessing some of you don't relate to that at all. Because you read this and you think this is the best news possible. You read about this community and you say, yes, this is what I want. I want to know others and I want to be known by others. I want to share my life with people. I want to be a central member of a community like this. And people like yourselves don't need a lot of convincing that community is a pivotal part of our spiritual journeys. But there are others of you out there, if you're really honest with yourselves, who are more skeptical. There are others of you out there who frequently ask the question, why in the world did I choose to go to a small Christian college in which everyone lives in dorms? Right? I know you're out there. And I count myself as one of you because I am an introvert. It doesn't mean that I'm shy or gloomy or standoffish or antisocial or socially awkward. All right, I'm a little socially awkward, but that's unrelated. <laughs> unrelated. You know, there may have been one time when in a church service at the passing of the peace part that I tried to hide under the pew in front of me, you know, but it was just one time, one time, <laughs> let it go. Now, being an introvert means that I find my energy in solitude and that I get drained around people. I like people, but I will often opt for time alone over social interaction. I often can find large groups of people, especially when I don't know many of them, intimidating. And I will often choose lower stimulation environments and I thrive in silence and solitude. And I find that much of my greatest creativity and many of my best moments of connecting with the Lord happen alone. Introversion is a really common personality feature that about half the population shares. About half fall on the introverted side of the scale. And there's actually a fair amount of neurological evidence now that introversion and extroversion are not only the product of upbringing and environment, but are actually hardwired into our brains. So I wrote this book called Introverts in the Church, which is aimed at helping people like myself navigate the perils of Christian community. The first, the first sentence in my book is, can introverts thrive in the church? But I was this close to having it be, can introverts survive the church? 
And that's because so many of our activities, so much of church culture, especially in evangelical communities, seems oriented towards these outgoing, energetic people who thrive on social interaction. And those of us who enjoy time alone can be viewed suspiciously. And I'm convinced this is more spiritually dangerous than you might think. It's about more than just personality type. I think that often, usually unintentionally, churches can communicate that faithfulness, that a maturing, growing discipleship looks like participation in as many activities as possible and in being acquainted with as many people as possible. So I think it's easy to read this little snapshot that we get of this ancient community in Acts and infer that the truly faithful community, the one where the face of God shines and the winds of the Spirit blow, are one in which people are constantly together. And so a, the, past, the work of the pastor in that sort of community becomes about trying to get Christians around one another as often as possible. So we need more meetings, more events, more small groups, more of everything. And, and the pastor starts to be less like kind of the more traditional understanding of teacher and counselor and more like church cruise director, right? Just organizing as many activities as possible. So one of the scholars I came across in my research put it this way. In churches, sociability is often mistaken for spirituality, that is, the more social you are, the more social your community is, it is thought, the closer you are to God. And so we get this message that a growing faith, if I want to grow in my faith, then I need to involve myself, myself in more activities because activities are at the heart of community life. So I get closer to God by doing more Christian activity. So I think as a result, we're always asking, what's next? Oh, you attend worship? Well, then you should think about coming to this event. Or you're in this small group, so you should also think about joining this team as well. Or, oh, you've been attending for two years? Well, then you should think about becoming a leader. It's always, what's next? What's the next activity that I can participate in? And so the dilemma in all of this um, is something I call the grand dilemma of Christian participation. And that is, when we're deciding between what activities to participate in, every option is a good one, right? Every option, if pursued with the right motivations, will help us grow as people and as followers of Jesus. So when we're choosing between Christian activities, it's not like we're choosing between, should I brush my teeth or should I not brush my teeth, right? It's more like, should I brush my teeth? Or should I take a shower? Fewer cavities, pleasant odor. Which, which do I choose, right? They're all good options. And because of that, because every option is good, I think we can become convinced that the faithful word in the Christian life is yes. If someone asks us to, asks us to participate in another activity, if we really want to grow, if we really trust God, then we will say yes. But no is the unfaithful word, right? No is the word that doesn't trust. No is the word that closes us off to God and to others. I think we have this tendency in communities to create these insider and outsider distinctions that can leave a lot of people on the outside or feeling a lot of guilt or even anger. And some of that probably is unavoidable, and some of those distinctions between insider and outsider are probably good because it gives a sense of identity and cohesion to a community. We just want to make the right distinctions. I think what we often do is we turn the Christian life and participation in Christian community into the series of rules. And the way that you follow the way that you show whether you're in or whether you're out is how well you follow these rules. Things like discipleship, worship, um, faith all feel kind of ambiguous to us sometimes, right? And ambiguity like feels out of control and elusive, and we don't like that feeling because it makes us feel anxious. So we want something really tangible that we can hold on to that will gauge how we're doing and how others are doing. 
And I think one of the gauges that we choose in relationship to Christian community is quantity. We measure progress by how many, how, much, how many times we go to worship, how many events we go to, how many small groups we're a part of, how many other activities we're doing. And if we want to grow, then we need to get involved in more groups and have more activities and have more responsibility in those groups and those activities. And all of this becomes this little membership badge that we can wear around and people can look at and say, oh, well, Adam is involved in all of those activities, and so therefore he is growing, he is inside the community, and he is progressing in his faith. And we come up with this little mold of faithfulness that we expect others and ourselves to live up to. And if we don't, that puts us on the outside. Well, I don't think that involvement in more and more activities is the mark of faithfulness. Participation in community life is a great thing. It's a necessary thing but I think it's a means to an end. Simply, as I can put it, I would say that the goal of the Christian life is love. Love for God, love for others, love for the poor, love for ourselves. Jesus said the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we're aiming for. That's how we measure progress in the Christian life. Love is the ideal. So I think a Christian community is moving toward God as it grows and acting out of love. And even though in that, those little verses in Acts, the word love is not used, I'm convinced that it was love and not activity that bound that church together. They were not just simply doing things together. They loved one another. Tertullian, the famous second century bishop, said this, what marks us in the eyes of our enemies is our loving kindness. They say, look how they love one another. That was the defining mark, agape, love. That's what made it stand out. That's what was so contagious about their life together. And you probably all know that love in the Bible is never just affection or warm feelings, though we encourage those. But it is an inward movement of the will and the heart that expresses itself in concrete action. Love in the Christian life is never an abstraction. But love motivates us to care for one another, to sacrifice for one another, to meet the needs of one another, and to draw in people who have not known the love of God. So I think the primary question we need to ask ourselves as individuals and as a community is, are we growing in love for God? Are we growing in love? And when we're considering how to participate in community, I think we need to ask, well, how can I, with my interests and my gifts, grow in love for God and love for others? And the reason community is so necessary is because community teaches us how to love how to listen, how to forgive, how to serve, how to show compassion. Participation in community for some of us may involve a a steep cost at times, but it's a cost that's always worth paying because it's in community that we learn how to be more like Jesus. All right, are you ready for this? For some of us, for some of us, growing in love may require us to be involved in fewer activities. Love may mandate fewer activities. And it's comments like that that keep me from getting a lot of invitations to guest preach in churches. (laughs) Because it's really, it's a lot easier to say it, I'll be honest, when you're not the the central leader of a community and you're not trying to, to gather a community together. But that doesn't change the fact that there are a lot of ways, sometimes very subtle ways, that activity can actually distract us from love. I think we live in a culture that has taught us that value comes from how busy you are. The more things I do, the more I am in motion, the less sleep I get, the more significant I am. It's a lie. It is a lie. Or sometimes some of us are utterly devoted to doing all the right things 
in life. If I can just follow all the right rules and make all the right decisions and surround myself with all the right people, then I'll finally find that path of happiness and success in life. But that's not love. That's legalism. And it doesn't work anyway. It can never give you what you want. If you haven't found that out now, you will later on. Sometimes I think we also participate because we're desperately looking for a, search of, uh, a sense of belonging. Belonging is one of the core longings of the human heart. To find a place that feels like home, where we are embraced as we are, to know and be known. But unfortunately, participation does not always guarantee a sense of belonging. Sometimes it almost feels like the more we participate the less we feel like we belong, the more we feel like we're on the outside. Well, here's the thing about belonging. You already belong. You already belong before you do any Christian activity. You are already children of God, chosen and adopted. You are already brothers and sisters of Christ. Jesus belongs to you, and you belong to Jesus. And so before you walk in that door, or before you walk into any door, you already belong, and you walk in as people who belong. And that is what frees you to love and be loved, no matter what your personality type. Let's pray. Gracious God, thanks that we are so deeply loved before we participate in any activities. Thanks that you give us community to teach us how to learn, to learn how to love, how to serve, how to grow. And I, I pray for my friends here at Westmont that this would be a community that is active, but more so, this would be a community that is marked by love. Love for you, love for one another, and love for those who have not known your love. We pray this in Jesus' name, who gave himself for our sake. Amen. You are dismissed. Go in peace.